All right, so today I'm going to be talking about native pondweed habitats, mostly in Sassoon Bay and then the West Delta. And forward this way. So uh, just to get sort of a, a background, a little framework for, for how this work got started, um, I was uh, working with a number of other people on the San Francisco Bay Subtitle Habitat Goals Report. And this was a project to come up with restoration and protection and conservation and management goals for the next 50 years within San Francisco Bay. And that project really only went up through Sassoon Bay and did not include the Delta. Um, and it, but it attempted to include the submerged vegetation in the subtitle zone um, as part of the goal making. Um, unfortunately, we had so little information um, on the stichenia beds up here in Sassoon Bay, the pond weeds, that really we knew that there were some locations, but they were just dots that we could put on a map. And that was about what we knew in contrast to actually really well mapped submerged vegetation beds throughout the lower portion of the estuary for eelgrass. Um, so really all that could be said at that point when it was time to make goals was to assess the status and distribution of other SAV besides eelgrass and to protect existing pondweed habitat, knowing that it was, um, well, it's considered essential fish habitat by NOAA and it typically would be a good habitat and a place where invertebrates would be present and be fish food and so it's something we probably wanted to protect, but that's about all we could come up with at that point. Not really knowing where the plants were or what they were doing or what their services were. Um, but I think probably a lot of the folks in the room have seen these beds. They can be quite large. It's not like people didn't know they were there, although there wasn't a lot of information about them. You can go along Simmons Island or Chips Island or there's an offshore shoal off of Winter Island as you're getting into the Delta. And these beds are quite large and obvious, um, even on not such a low tide because the canopies form up on the surface of the water. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've been learning over the last couple of years. This is kind of a new habitat for my research lab. Um, we really got started up here because people said, hey, you know, there's these plants under the water and we're not, not entirely sure what they are. We don't really know where all they are and we would love to know more about them. And we know you work underwater in the lower bay. So why don't you come up here and do some work on this? And we said, okay. So this is a, a few years of work that we've been doing, looking at spatial and seasonal abundance patterns, salinity and turbidity effects that we've been able to measure in mesocosm experiments, tank experiments, and then looking a little bit at competition with the geria densa, and then some predictions and management implications. All right, so I know some of these animations are messed up, so. All right, so we first started out doing a mapping effort. This began in um, June of 2011, and um, we're continuing to do it a little at a time. Um, so what we did was reviewed aerial images, Google Earth maps essentially, and, and Bing images, and we digitized those beds using ArcGIS, and then we navigated to the locations that we had drawn the polygons on and uh, looked to see whether or not those polygons matched the locations that we were able to see from the aerial imagery. And if not, we did some adjustments, um, but I'll tell you in a sec that, that those um, digitizing efforts were pretty accurate, actually. Um, so we did go and ground truth the size of the patch and the, and the plant acreage, and this was largely done by my graduate students, Whitney Thornton and Jeff Lewis. You can see how evident these beds are from aerial images. Um, they have a pretty distinct look to them, um, and especially as we found out later, they're pretty much pure pond weeds, so there's not much to mix up in them either, at least in Sassoon Bay. We now know from that two years of, of mapping that there are more than 1,200 acres of stichenia um, throughout Sassoon Bay. Um, you can see Ryer Island here, uh, Middle Ground, Chips Island, Winter Island, and getting on into Sherman Lake. The beds actually go beyond this, but this was sort of the limits of the study that, that we were doing at that point in time. So there's more than 1,200 acres because this plant actually goes up into the delta. It's just not as uh, abundant when you get past this area that we did match, map. Um, so we did learn through the process of digitizing and then going out and ground truthing that these beds are, are pretty easily matched just using aerial imagery. And that was pretty cool. Um, we thought that was an awesome thing, actually, because when we try to do that with eelgrass, it doesn't work. 
Yale grass is not up at the surface for the most part, and aerial imagery has to be taken at just exactly the right time and right depth um, in order to be able to detect it. Whereas to Kenya, you still have to be careful with the images. You want to take them during the summertime, which are spring, summer, into fall, early fall, as I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. So you have to be careful the time of year, and you want to get a lower tide so you're sure the plants are fully up on the surface. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's a good way of, of, of looking at these bats. And I, I encourage you to go take a look on Google Earth and take the little timeline, um, the little button that you can move through time and go back to previous images. And you can go back to 1993 and you can pick these beds out on a lot of the images, not all of them, but a lot. So because we realized that we could do that digitizing from aerial images, and that was a good way of mapping, uh, with just a little bit of ground truth thing to try to make it uh, more perfect, uh, we were interested in thinking about how to use older images as a way of looking at how these beds have changed through time. And so we used ArcMap and digitized bed polygons. Um, we did fall 1993 and fall 2002, and then, of course, I just showed you 2012. So we have two decadal periods that we can compare how the Stokinia changed. And understand it's not perfect because we can't go back to 1993 and ground truth, right? We're just going on those images, but we feel pretty confident about them. Oh, sorry, this is one of the animations that didn't quite work. Um, so in 1993, this is what it looked like. I showed you Rye Island a second ago, and you remember there were quite a few um, areas of, of beds over here that were not present in 93. Um, I'll just flip through these, actually, and, and then I'll go back. So 2002, start to see some small little beds adding on but, and other beds just expanding from their existing locations. And then in 2012, some of those expanding even more and then also a bunch of new additional beds. Um, so let me just flip through that one more time so you can see it. Okay, so we're getting quite a bit of expansion of these beds within this region. Um, new locations as well as larger areas covered by um, plants that were nearby. So in all, we're getting roughly about a 19% increase when we calculate how that's changed. Not very much of a change between um, 1993 and 2002, even though we know that there were some new beds, but they weren't very big. But um, from 2002 to 2012, about, about a 20% change uh, increase in acreage. So we think these beds are expanding, and uh, we believe that they're expanding up the estuary during this period of drought that we're getting. And I'll tell you a little bit more about um, that in a minute. So I've told you a little bit about distribution, and I want to tell you a little bit about what the beds are like themselves now, seasonally, how they change, and what they're like. And so within Sassoon Bay, we had four different stations that we did quarterly surveys at. Ryer Island, Wheeler Island, Chips, and Winter, uh, getting right into the, the western portion of the delta. And this was from fall 2011 until fall 2012 with the question, what are the spatial and seasonal patterns in these SAV beds? So we use this rake detection method. Um, this is me hanging on to my graduate student, Evan, trying to keep her from going overboard because this is quite heavy to pull up. But it's a good way of measuring these plants um, when you can't see very well through the water and um, when they're really dense down through the water column. So you run a, this rake uh, through the water as the boat's moving along for a set amount of time and distance, and then you pull the rake up and you count the number of times, tines on the rake that have whatever plant is there present on them, and that gives you a percent detection measure. So these are those sites from west to east, again, Rye or Wheeler, Chips and Winter. And these are the time periods that we looked at. And these are the percent detections. Okay. Um, I'll just point out a few things about this. So primarily we're looking at Stukenia. Um, there is a little bit of Egeria present. That's the striped bars. A little bit of Ceratophyllum demersum, which is also a native species. And a little bit of the non-native Potamogeton crispus. But for the most part, these big black bars, that's, that's Stukenia. So these beds are, are really pretty much all pond weed. Um, and the other thing you might notice is that in the wintertime, there's very little pond weed present. So these beds are senescing in the winter, and that's something important to think about because we think they're important for habitat, but they're not important for habitat during the winter months. 
So that's something to keep in mind. Um, they start to really uh, grow and expand during um, May uh, into the summer and into the fall. Pretty much the peak biomass um, for each bed is in the summer or fall. Okay, so the rake does catch some of the species that are not as abundant because you're really digging it down through the water column and pulling it up and seeing species that you might not see otherwise. Um, we're comparing this, sorry this is cut off by the little WebEx message, but um, this is percent cover in comparison to these data I just showed you. And pretty much it looks the same. Um, this is looking through the surface of the water and estimating cover just visually. But you can see that some of those rarer species drop out. Uh, we, just, we just can't see them in that case. So we do like this rake method, and it's been used by a number of, of groups for, for estimating SAV um, abundance. So let me now show you how things compare. This is the, the, these are the four sites I already showed you, and then we start to then compare the dominant species that are into the West Delta. Um, Hopefully you can read the Sherman Lake, Big Break, uh, Decker Island, and Fisherman's Cut were, the, were those locations. And so this is what I already showed you, Rye or Wheeler, Chips and Winter, and then moving uh, west to east, sort of, Big Break, Sherman, Fisherman's Cut, and Decker, these are kind of on two different parts of the, of the confluence. Um, but probably what you notice first and foremost is that there's a lot of Egeria now, so that's the Brazilian waterweed that I'm sure probably most of you guys are really familiar with. Um, you might also notice that there are a number of other species present, actually a lot more species than are present in the stachinia beds. But they tend to be abundant, or tend to be much less abundant, so they're, they're pretty rare. Um, some native, some non-native. But you can also see that Egeria is present in the, in the wintertime. Um, it does senesce somewhat, but pretty much is present during the winter months, whereas stachinia is not. Okay, so I've been telling you about stachenia, and I've been calling it SPA in some of these slides so far, and that's because we're still not really sure what we've got. Either of the two species we might have are native, but um, we're not sure, actually, if we might just have one species that looks really different um, in different locations, or if it's two different species, or maybe there could be hybrids. So this genus actually does hybridize in other locations, and these two species have been found to hybridize in other locations. Um, this is what they look like. This one is kind of olivey colored and more sort of ropey, thick, broader leaves, um, thinner leaves, uh, less bushy looking than this one. This one tends to be a brighter green color, thinner leaves, and, and more bushy. Um, so in the water, um, that's kind of what they look like. And they, to us, it, it suggests that they could be different in terms of the habitat that they provide as well. So if you think about this real open canopy that you get with this ropey form versus this really sort of lush leafy form, um, if the number of invertebrates corresponds to the number of leaves, this could be a real different habitat. And that's something that we're exploring now to try to, to, to understand a little bit better. So um, there's also a big difference in the height I haven't mentioned yet. So these can be up to three meters, this ropey form. And these are typically shorter, about a meter long. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, let me show you. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Can you tell that this is kind of olive colored and this is kind of like darker green, brighter green? Maybe. Um, the point is, is that you can actually pick these out in pretty close proximity to each other. And that would suggest either there's something really different about the environment, even though there's really close spatially, like there's a difference in depth or sediment that changes over a short spatial scale, um, or that there's two different species or a hybrid or, you know, there's something else going on here. So we are trying to work that out. So explanations could be phenotypic plasticity, so the plants actually just look different if they're in slightly different conditions, perhaps with different nutrients or flow or sediment texture, something like that, that they're experiencing depth. Um, but it could be that there's genetic differences, whole different species, different genotypes that are distinct from each other within a species, or hybridization. Um, so we are trying to explore this a little bit. And like I was saying, there is hybridization known for this group, but also there's, there's phenotypic plasticity is really well known for this group. 
So you can take uh, plants from still water and put them in high flow and they do change their morphology. Um, so that could possibly explain some of these instances where we see these differences in the field, although it doesn't seem quite right for when we see them side by side. Okay, so just to note in one of these papers, looking uh, really closely at these, at these plants within this family, um, the Potamogetanaceae have markedly different phenotypes in running water. Linear leaf plants of Stichenia tend to have wider leaves in running water compared to the same genotype growing in standing water. Standing water. Um, so it should not be surprising to us that there could be differences in what we see depending on where the plants are. So one of the ways we're trying to get at this, so this is um, work from Melissa Patton's thesis that's going on right now. And this is to take shoots that we know are, are genetically identical because we've pulled them up and they're connected by a rhizome. And we put them in two different conditions with flow in a tank, circular flow, or with no flow, just bubbling for aeration. And then we can take a look and see, do we find that the plants actually change their morphology and to what degree can they do that? So if they start out really kind of bushy and, and with lots of leaves and thin leaves, do they become more like the other form and vice versa when you change the flow conditions that they're in? So what's sort of the scope for their ability to change? And then in addition, Melissa, uh, who I mentioned a second ago, is also working on the genetics of these plants. So she should be able to look um, both, well, she is already looking at nuclear and chloroplast DNA, and she is going to be able to tell do we have two species, do we have hybrids, and um, because we've collected from a bunch of places around the estuary, we should have a good sense then um, how prevalent is one or the other, or do we just have all the same thing? So stay tuned for that. Um, Melissa's just getting her first DNA results back, and so far her first three samples have all been Stichenia pectinata. So we'll see. <laughs> She's got a lot more to go. All right, so let's talk about salinity and turbidity effects. So mostly for these experiments that we've done, we've used the form that's most like Stichenia filiformis. So that's the ropey form that we find more commonly in Sassoon Bay. So we, we're calling it Stichenia filiformis in some of these slides coming up. So I think it's no surprise to you guys what this estuary is like. We've got salt water coming in from the ocean and fresh water coming in from the delta. And we're really interested in where exactly the salinity changes. Um, you guys are probably very familiar with X2, that point where salinity is two um, PSUs. Um, and there's been a, a mapping of this, and there's this great little flip book, the low salinity zone flip book that I think is pretty awesome because you can actually look at different scenarios and see where this, this, um, the different uh, levels of salinity occur in different locations. Um, so this was the summer, um, late in the summer, we, we had salinities up to three in Sherman Lake, um, which we think of as being, you know, full on Delta region, pretty much fresh water. So we've got high salinities going into that area relative to what we may think um, ought to be there uh, relative to current conditions or recent uh, management uh, decisions and things. Um, one estimate with sea level rise, 60 centimeters of sea level rise, that um, was that that salinity wedge would move quite a bit further up and that we would actually have a salinity of five well into the delta. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that this might happen. It can happen through sea level rise. We know that that's already happen, happening. It could happen through management actions um, that influence freshwater. It could happen by a massive breaching of levees that pulls saltier water up through the estuary. Lots of ways and combinations of ways that we could have higher salinities coming into the delta than what we currently do. Um, and you can kind of see that in a drought year like this as I, was, as I was showing you. So a question that we had that we wanted to test experimentally was how will Ageria densa, the Brazilian water weed, and Stichenia respond to an increase in salinity of five. And what's their tolerance for that kind of a, of a salinity increase that we might expect through a number of different mechanisms? So a lot of this work is from Evan Borgnes' thesis, and she set up a mesocosm experiment at the romberg Tiburon Center. These are 55-gallon drums, or 200 liters, and this was in 2012. And she uh, used salinities of 0, 5, 10, and 15, 
and she had Stachenia or Egeria present. So this is not looking at competition. I'll show you some on that a little bit later. So either one species or the other present. And then um, replication was five tanks for each of the treatments. So this is just looking at each of these species individually as they occurred in this experiment, the Egeria by itself, Stachenia by itself, relative to these salinity levels that we tested. And this is percent change in the biomass of the plants. So I think probably you can see, well, let me first explain these. So this round, the round circles are the, um, our shoot biomass, the open circles, the shoot number is the, is the filled circles, and then root biomass is on this axis, that's the open squares. And I think you should be able to tell pretty easily that the plants grew uh, quite a bit, a uh, thousand percent change um, with, uh, in, in freshwater. So the plants were quite happy in freshwater. You get to five parts per thousand and they really crash. Um, so Egeria does not like five parts per thousand. And in fact, when you get to 10 or 15, the plants are essentially dead. Um, Stachenia, on the other hand, also does best at zero, uh, declines a bit at five, uh, persists at 10, it declines at 15, but it actually replaced its biomass during the course of the, of the experiment. So it's able to persist and, and actually do pretty well at, at 15 parts per thousand. So I think that that gives you a sense for why they are where they are, for one thing. Stachenia is in the places that are getting more saline at this point, but in drought years and with greater uh, salinity from a variety of different mechanisms, we could have a lot more Stachenia moving up through the estuary, whereas Egeria is probably not going to do so well in those western portions of the delta if salinity continues to rise in that area. So changes in turbidity, let's take a look at that for a second. I think probably most of the people in the room know that um, there have been recent efforts to look at changes in water clarity and the amount of turbidity in the water. And um, this work by Schulhammer at the USGS and, and his colleagues uh, has, has shown that there's been a large decrease in the erodible sediment pool and also that light availability has been increasing. Okay, so this is just showing you the year, and this is the annual sediment load, the hydraulic mining period, that load was very high, not surprisingly. Um, it decreased quite a bit by 1909 to 1966 period. And then this is, if you can't read it, 1959 to um, 1990. And then a precipitous decline since that time. So somewhere about 1999, 2000, uh, a, a real dramatic drop. Um, in the amount of erodible sediment pool, and then also the, the light that's available uh, in the water column. So will this increased light enhance submerged aquatic vegetation performance above present conditions is one question that we have. And will the increased light compensate for negative effects that salinity has on both of these species that I showed you? So this is another similar experiment. Um, same mesocosm tanks done in a different period. Their turbid turbidity treatment was present par, measured just below the water surface. Um, so this was relative to measures we'd taken in the field. It's about 215 micromolar Einsteins per meter squared per second, which we simulated just by putting window screen over the tanks and with the reduction of light from the, the top of the greenhouse. And then versus the future, which was two times the amount of light of present, which was basically just not window screen. So we simulated current conditions and future conditions with just a guess that it could be two times more light penetrating. And this was crossed with salinity, this time zero, five, and 10 parts per thousand only. And we had stachenia by itself or ageria by itself. Okay. so. The treatments here are Egeria, two times present conditions, is the lighter bar, or present conditions, and then Stachenia, two times present light conditions, and then present conditions. And this is percent change in dry mass at the three different salinities that we tested. So I think you can see right away that there's at least a trend of Egeria increasing in biomass with greater light. That's not that surprising that plants are gonna like a little bit more light than they currently get. But you might also know that for Egeria, note that for Egeria, the plants really crashed um, regardless of how much light they got if they were at higher salinities. 
So five or 10 parts per thousand, it doesn't matter how much light you give them, they're not gonna be able to manage that salinity. Okay, when we look at stachenia here, you can see there's a big increase um, in biomass with greater light. And that's true at all the salinities. So um, that's quite a different pattern than, than we see with the geria. So just to kind of sum up this part of the talk, looking at salinity and turbidity, we had the question, will Egeria and Stachenia respond? How will they respond to an increase in salinity of five um, PSU? We found that Egeria thrives at zero, declines at, at salinities, all salinities of uh, five and above. We found that Stachenia thrived at salinities of zero to 10 and persists at 15, although it's not quite as happy then, happy being a technical term. Will increased light enhance SAV performance above ambient conditions? For Egeria, yes, if it's in freshwater. If it's at higher salinities, it doesn't matter how much light you give it. Stachenia, yes, at all the salinities that we tested, zero, five, and 10. So our other question, will increased light compensate for negative salinity effects? We would say for Egeria, no, because there was mortality above, at five and above, regardless of how much light we gave it. For Stachenia, yes, uh, there seemed to be light enhancement of growth at all the salinities. Okay, so we suspect that, um, that, that stachenia will really benefit from increased light, uh, regardless of where it's located currently, um, whereas uh, Egeria is um, not going to do well with um, increased light if there's any salinity pretty much at all. Okay, so let's talk about competition with Egeria. So in general, competition along a stress gradient is something ecologists have looked at for a long time. This idea that tolerance to stress sorts out for estuarine plants as well as other organisms along shores along an axis of osmotic stress. Um, so if it's more stressful uh, in terms of salinity, it's, it's, a, it's an osmotic potential issue for the plants um, in order to be able to balance their water, um, their, their fresh water intake. And so um, in places that have higher salinity, it's a very stressful place to be. Um, so uh, typically as you move up in estuaries, particularly for wetland plants, um, you find that there's a greater diversity of wetland plants and um, in general, the plants um, are able to grow much greater biomass. And that is because um, they're not dealing with the stress of salinity. But when that's going on, there's more competition. So a lot of plants are happy in those kinds of conditions and um, then they start to compete. So competition might keep stress tolerant species from the most benign habitats. So it may be that species that can tolerate stress are in the higher salinity conditions simply because they can tolerate those higher salinity conditions and they're not good competitors for the fresher areas. Is that something you guys have heard of before? So that's, yeah, so that's been tested in a, in a bunch of different kinds of habitats actually. But we were interested in that, thinking about the salinity gradient with the submerged aquatic vegetation species and how it might influence competition between Egeria and Stachenia. So might Egeria outcompete Stachenia in fresher waters? And might that be the reason why we see a lot less Stachenia as we get into the delta? So this was a salinity cross with competition experiment, same mesocosm setup, salinity of zero, five, 10, and 15, Stachenia or Egeria or both of them together so we could test their ability to compete under these different conditions. Okay, so just to orient you to this, so again, the salinity here, 0, 5, 10, and 15, change in dry biomass. Here, Egeria by itself, Egeria with, with Stachenia present, Stachenia by itself, Stachenia with Egeria present. Okay, so at a salinity of zero, zero, there's a trend of increased biomass for Egeria when Stachenia is, is present in the fresh water. Um, so this suggests that actually Egeria does better when it's got a competitor that's not itself than it does when itself is present. So uh, intra interspecific um, competition versus interspecific intraspecific competition. Do they say that right? Um, so Egeria actually does better in freshwater when it has Stachenia present than it does when that same space is taken by other Egeria. Um, whereas Stachenia in that same uh, salinity treatment declines when Egeria is present. 
So suggesting that there is competition going on there. All right, so when we look at salinity of five or higher, Ageria, again, just really doesn't do very well at all. So it stops being able to compete um, in that case. And that's true for uh, the change in dry biomass or the change in shoot number. If we look at Stachenia's shoot number, it actually increases dramatically when Ageria is present, if you're at five parts per thousand salinity. All right, so that's suggesting that when you get to a higher salinity, of only five parts per thousand, that Stukenia could outcompete Ageria, because Ageria is just not doing all that well. All right, so in general, Ageria is a better competitor in fresh water, and Stukenia tolerates brackish water, probably because it can, it, it's, it's present in brackish places because it can be there, um, and it doesn't have competition with Ageria there because it can't take the salinity and you move up into higher salinity areas, and then you can't support the stachenia because it doesn't compete so well. So this is just a mesocosm experiment. This doesn't tell us everything about what happens in the field, but it is suggestive of the patterns that we see in the field. So key points from this, spatial and seasonal abundance patterns, um, SAV beds and Sassoon are almost entirely stachenia. Um, Stachenia is providing food and cover in the spring through fall periods, not in the winter, unless you're eating the turions. So the turions are these little vegetative reproductive structures that develop in the root area of the stachenia. And some birds, like canvasback ducks in particular, really like those. So they could be providing food for diving birds during that time period, but for the most part they're not providing physical habitat structure during the winter months because they're just not present above ground. Um, Ageria dominates the delta beds year round and those beds are pretty diverse. Those other species are not common in the beds, they're, they tend to be kind of rare actually, but there are quite a few species present in those um, Ageria beds and again that may be because those species can not tolerate higher salinities, so they're there in the freshwater areas primarily but they're not quite as good of competitors as Ageria, or not nearly as good of competitors as Ageria, so they're there in low abundance. Okay, salinity and turbidity. Stukenia had a really broad tolerance for salinity, zero to 15 parts per thousand. Ageria had very limited um, tolerance for salinity, really something less than five parts per thousand is all it can take. Um, both species will benefit from more light, but Ageria only in freshwater. And light may reduce salinity stress for stachenia because it can actually take advantage of that light at all the salinities that we tested it at. And then for competition, we think that Ageria might exclude stachenia from freshwater areas. So we definitely see it in freshwater areas, but at much less abundance. All right, so a few predictions and management implications. So we think in a saltier, less turbid upper estuary region that stachenia will be able to maintain its current distribution. So um, it could actually increase by about five parts per thousand in Sassoon and, and probably those plants would persist there and the plants would be able to move further um, into the delta because of salinities being higher there and Ageria not being able to handle those. Ageria will shift further into the delta um, and we also think that it will be squeezed, squeezed by temperature. So I didn't show you these experiments but we've also looked at the effects of high temperatures on Ageria. When you get to 30 parts per thousand, uh, 30, sorry, 30 degrees C, uh, Ageria really doesn't perform well. So as temperatures also go up with climate change, um, we suspect as you move really far inland in the, within the delta that there'll be places where Ageria doesn't do well there. So it's gonna be squeezed more in the middle of the delta uh, because it's gonna have salinity pushing from the west and it's gonna have temperature um, issues in other parts of the delta. So we think there could possibly be management potential if you could remove Ageria um, from areas where Stukenia is not competing well against it. It might be an opportunity to have more Stukenia present um, in freshwater areas. And really this requires a field experiment or possibly a transplant to try to look and see whether this would be the case. So, in general, we think of SAV as kind of a, a, a bad character in the delta. And um, this, is, this is sort of a, a working conceptual model of what this means. So when we have a geria present, we know that it becomes a very dense canopy 
uh, it reduces turbidity locally, and that can lead to clearer water, but also really shaded areas, which might be good hideouts for non-native predatory fish. And that could mean that there's negative effects on, on native fish. And there's some good support for, for that part of the conceptual model. This we know much less about, and some of this really needs to be tested. So when we're talking about stichenia as the native species of submerged vegetation, the canopy is quite open. The plant leaves are all up at the surface. So down through the water column, there's really no physical structure. And that means that while there might be really small changes in turbidity, for the most part, these beds are really turbid. And these plants do not have the capability of reducing turbidity to the same degree that Egeria does. Um, so this could mean that for um, small fish that use turbidity as a refuge from predation, they hide in turbid water, that could be a, a good place for them. Uh, we do know that there are lots of food resources there as well. I'll show you a slide on that in a second. And we know that this is along the position, along the migratory paths of fish species that we're concerned about in this region. So in general, we think there could be positive effects on native fish of having more of these native plants present. But again, I'd say this is really untested at this point, and we would need to actually do um, sampling within this habitat to see what fish are present. Um, and we would have to look at gut contents and, and, and really actually explore this in more detail. But that's the working conceptual model, and that's why we think it might be valuable to think about doing restoration of this, of this species. And certainly that's part of why we want to know which species we have or, you know, is, is, is the um, morphology of the plant just reacting to its environment. It might influence which morphology you would collect if it's actually a different species that's going to maintain that morphology in the place you might move it to. So just showing you a little bit about what's on these plants, you know, we, we see grazing scars on the plants themselves on the stichenia, so we know that something is eating those. We have some isotope data that suggests that it's, um, uh, let's see if I have them in this picture, that might be one of them, um, an isopod that is common on these, on these plants or possibly amphipods. We do collect when we take the plants and we, um, shake them out in fresh water and we sieve the contents, we get loads and loads, hundreds of individual invertebrates on each shoot. And you can see them crawling around here as isopods, amphipods. Um, this is also an attachment place for algae and bryozoans. So uh, like a lot of different kinds of submerged vegetation, these are probably providing habitat in terms of structure to attach to for a number of different organisms as well. So. We're really just beginning to understand what role these might play in the food web, but it seems like there's a lot of potential for them to be providing food resources to, to fish in this region. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and just um, thank a few people in my lab who've done a lot of work on this, and also um, thank funding sources, the Delta Science Council and the Ecosystem Restoration Program, and also NOAA Fisheries, who gave us some of the first funds to start to do the mapping of, this, of these areas. We do have these maps up online. Um, if you go to RTC's webpage, Romberg Tiburon Center, uh, rtc.sfsu.edu, and just go to the Boyer Lab, you can find those maps. I don't think you want to necessarily write that down if you're interested. But you can get to those maps and, and see where we're, where we're finding the pond weeds. So I'm going to stop there and see if you guys have any questions for me. Get out of this. Twelve forty-eight. That was pretty good timing. It's pretty good timing. And uh, oh. have you looked at all at the uh, difference in invertebrates on the Egeria versus the Stachania? Yes, we have, and we're in the process of of doing that. We just did um, we did quite a bit of sampling seasonally through two thousand and twelve. And then um, because we've been in this drought period, we're interested in knowing how those invertebrate communities might be changing with the drought. And so we've gone, we went back out in the fall of 2014 and took another set of samples from the eight locations that I showed you. 
So do we see a, a shift from fall 2012 to fall 2014 is what we're working on right now. Um, and it, does, it looks like it actually. There's some species that are much more common now that weren't common in 2012. So um, that's something we wasn't quite ready to report on, but we will have some good data on that pretty soon. And yes, it's quite a different community in part just because of the fresher water. You know, you get a lot more insect larvae on the Egeria than you do on the Stachenia, for example. Um, but there's some species that we're finding in the Delta that we're really surprised to find actually on the Egeria. Um, one of those is an amphipod that we've been studying a lot in the lower bay on the eelgrass. It's called Amphithoe valida, and it eats the eelgrass in San Francisco Bay, and it's been a conservation and restoration concern is it really mows the leaves down and the, and the seeds, the fruits on the, on the flowering shoots of the eelgrass when we're trying to do restoration, it's kind of an issue. And this amphipod doesn't, it's non-native, it doesn't eat the eelgrass in its native habitat. So we were very surprised to find it in fresh water. So it seems to have huge, a huge tolerance for salinity and uh, we don't quite know what to make of it yet, but um, it's, I think we're gonna find some really interesting things uh, when we get this work done. Yeah. Uh, the amphithoe is just found on the Egeria? Oh, it's on the Stachenia too. Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, that was actually the same question I was going to ask. So I'm trying to think of a different one. But so, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, and maybe you touched on this or not. But did you find any differences about the types of habitat occupied by the two different species? Meaning, in terms of depth or substrate differences or anything like that or, you know, you mean wave Egeria? influence yeah. or, you know. Egeria versus Stachenia or yeah. the two different forms of Stachenia? Egeria versus Stachenia. We do sometimes find uh, Stachenia in somewhat deeper water outside of places where we find Egeria. Um, it may be because it can take a bit more flow than Egeria can. We're not really sure. Um, so it can be that, that Stachenia is found in deeper water, but you know, Egeria is also often just floating around as, as mats that aren't attached to anything, and so water depth doesn't really matter in that case. Um, so as long as they can stay in place and not get washed out, they can be in, in some deeper water places too. Um, sediment type, we haven't done anything with sediment at this point. Uh, so I think that's kind of a, a black box, and we've been talking lately about what might be in those sediments in terms of organic matter and how that might be fueling um, growth of the aquatic plants um, over time, just a continuous source of nutrients potentially in some areas. Um, but that's something that, as far as I know, we just don't have any data on. We certainly don't in my lab. Oh, we got a microphone back there. Uh, you, might have, you might have just partially answered my question. In your temperature and salinity tests, did you see a response in propagule production and survival, uh, viability? So, let's see. I didn't know. I didn't show you any of those data. We looked at flowering. Um, you know, we did, we did see some Egeria flowering, but, you know, Egeria doesn't reproduce sexually, so far as we know, um, in any place where it's been introduced. So you just see the male flowers. So. In a way, that's wasted effort if they flower more, right? They could be putting that into growth, but they're flowering for some, with something that they then can't use to reproduce sexually. So um, we did, let's see, I'll try to remember this off the top of my head. Um, we found slightly greater amounts of flowering in the stachenia at five parts per thousand than we did in the zero. So we found growth to be greater at zero, but five might be kind of the sweet spot for Stachenia um, in terms of its sexual reproduction. And we don't know how much it's doing that in the field. We hardly ever find mature fruits in the field for Stachenia. And in fact, that's part of the problem. We're having trouble figuring out what species we have because that's one of the major um, characters that's used to identify and tell the different species apart in this family. So um, we've been growing them in a common garden experiment to try to get them to flower and produce fruits so then we could look at the fruits. And we've only been able to get them to fruit a couple of times. And so that's part of the issue with the ID that the fruits, they're too big for the one species and not beaked enough for the other species. So they don't really match either one exactly. So that's 
tubers and turions. Greater, um, greater tuber and turion production at zero and five parts per thousand than at 10 or 15. So, um, you know, definitely constraints on those plants at higher salinities as well. And at 15 parts per thousand, the plants shed most of their above ground tissue and, but then re-sprouted. So their biomass stayed about the same from start to end. And that's pretty impressive that they were able to replace their biomass even if they were stressed out, but they were stressed out if they, if they dropped tissue at 15, so, yeah. So towards the end, you were talking about restoration and talking about um, the potential for stachinia to have, uh, to create better environments, but I was unclear as to how you thought uh, stachinia might change the turbidity and not just respond to turbidity? Because you, you were talking about the clear versus not, not clear. You know, we've, we've not observed big changes in turbidity inside versus outside of stachinia beds. And it's a hard thing to test because if you move right outside of a stachinia bed, you're usually in deeper, faster water. So if it's good habitat for stachinia along a shoreline, stachinia is there. So, um, trying to compare what the, any of the conditions are like inside a bed versus outside is tricky because you don't have everything the same except the presence of the plants in the adjacent location. That's true for any of these plants that you try to take measurements of in the field. Um, but just our, our gut is that the Sukenia is not changing turbidity dramatically. Um, I think it changes flow to some degree with that surface canopy. Um, but not the way that Egeria can with, you know, the biomass moving all the way, you know, covering throughout the, the, the water column. Well, so, you, so how does Egeria Densa outcompete Stukinia at zero salinity? Mechanistically, how does it do that? Well, so that's something we really don't know in the field. That's why I say we should test that in the field. But in the tanks, it fills the water column. Um, such that the stachinia, even though its canopy is mostly at the, the leaves are mostly at the surface, it does have leaves further down. And so it doesn't become as um, densely foliated if the ageria is present. This is probably light. It might be nutrients. Um, we didn't have really clear evidence that it was nutrients from our mesocosm experiment, but it, that could be part of the, part of the story. Yeah, so we, we don't really, we don't really know. Um, it's some sort of resource competition, but which one or some combination, I'm not sure. All right. Do you guys want the microphone? Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering about water hyacinths. I told you not to ask me about, I, I told you guys so, don't ask me yeah, about Yeah, I'm water wondering about water hyacinths. Is yeah. that all farther upstream than? Yeah, I mean, I personally haven't done any work on water hyacinth. Um, it tends to not be as common in the parts of the estuary that I've mostly focused on. Um, although that might be changing here, um, it was just had such a massive expansion over the last few years that, um, you know, central and all the eastern portions of the delta have been really very negatively affected by it. I'm sure everybody here knows that. Um, so I don't, you know, there's, did you ask me how does it compete? What did you ask me? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, possibly. So, there's been a little bit of work out of Susan Houston's lab at UC Davis by Shruti Khanna, um, looking at mapped presence of water hyacinth versus Egeria. And when water hyacinth is controlled, Egeria can increase and when it's not, then Egeria decreases because it's shaded. So those two definitely, um, if they're co-occurring, um, would uh, influence each other potentially. Not the Egeria so much on the on the water hyacinth, but the other way around. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, this should be the last one. I, yeah, I okay. had a question. I don't even know if I need this. Um, just about temperature, because you mentioned sort of like a sort of a pinch point for Ageria, I think, and, and I was not understanding that very well. 
the temperature effects and how that might occur in the delta, some of your predictions. Yeah, so on average, the, the temperature that we measured during the course of our study in the delta was about 22 C, um, but we did find salinities because we did continuous, um, sorry, temperature, continuous temperature monitoring during that period. So we did find spikes of as high as 30 um, degrees C. Um, and so that's how we decided what um, temperatures to test. We did 22, 26, and 30. And Nigeria really did not perform well under 30 uh, degrees C. And so it's, we already are getting those temperatures at times. So the concept is that we may be getting more temperatures like that and maybe in the warmer geographic locations, which tend to be further east, that's gonna be a, a, a problem for Nigeria. That's a hypothesis. I think that's absolutely true, that there's going to be places that there are um, more contained where there's less water motion that are going to heat up more, and that's not going to necessarily matter where they're located in the delta. Um, but sort of thinking across the whole space of the delta, we would expect it would be, in general, more, more warm as you're moving further inland, at least at certain times of the year. Not if we get a whole lot of snow melt and uh, if we actually get a lot of rain and get a lot of snow. Okay, I guess that concludes our presentation, and thank you for Dr. Boyer again. You're welcome. And please join us for the next Brown Bag, which will be next Tuesday. And thank you, Dr. Boyer, again.